Здравствуйте, дамы и господа. Сегодня в «Зеленой гостиной» Кристофер Уилден, один из самых известных современных хореографов. Он вернулся в Большой театр второй раз. На днях у нас здесь состоится премьера его спектакля «Зимняя сказка». А много лет назад он уже здесь работал и ставил балет, который назывался «Misery Chords». Ladies and gentlemen, I am very happy to present you Christopher Wilden, one of the most famous contemporary choreographer who returns to the Bolshoi Theater for the second time in a row. As in a couple days we're going to have here a premiere of Winter Tale. And many years ago Christopher was here doing «Misery Chords», though on our new stage and now on his stage. Uh, Christopher, how would you identify yourself? Do you feel yourself English, American, international, <laughs> ballet dancer? Who are you? Many things. <laughs> I'm, I'm all of those things. I'm all of those things. Um, I mean, you know, my heritage, my upbringing um, is, is very much still English. Um, but America has been my adopted country now for 25 years. Um, so for more years than I lived in England, um, so I'm now an American citizen. I have both passports, um, but I also consider myself to be a citizen of the world because I travel so much and um, I feel very welcome in, in you know al almost every place that I go and um, and have received a wonderful welcome this time here at the Bolshoi. And you said that coming nowadays to Bolshoi, you felt that Moscow is different, company is different, and yourself is different. Yeah, very much so. <laughs> I mean, my first visit here was uh, in 2003. Um, I think I'm getting that date right. Uh, and um, I just remember driving even, e even from the airport into Moscow and feeling the city very imposing. And I was quite scared to come the first time. You know, the Bolshoi like the Mariinsky are uh, in ballet are uh, kind of the, the mothership. <laughs> and, um, and so to come to such a historic house, um, to, uh, to a country that was both familiar because my teacher was from the Vaganova, um, was from the Kirov Ballet um, at the Royal Ballet School. Um, so I have very fond memories of him, but also quite, quite uh, frightened memories of him because he was very strict. Um, so I think I brought a lot of, of um, kind of preconceived notions when I came last time. And this time, well, obviously I'm older, I have more experience. Um, and, and that same drive from the airport coming into the center of Moscow, all the buildings were lit so beautifully. It felt suddenly very, very different, very much like a, a fairy tale. And, um, uh, and so far my visit here has been, um, has, been, has been true to that, you know, the dancers here in the company are, as they were then, wonderful, but perhaps now even more open, um, maybe more, they have more experience themselves. They've danced for more uh, Western choreographers. Um, they've made a lot more new creations. I think I was sort of at the beginning of a shift for the company. Uh, the last visit. But I'm more even interested in uh, your notice that you changed yourself. How are you noticing that you are changing? Well, <laughs> you know, one of the benefits of age, we all know that we all know what the uh, what the what the the the, um, the downside of growing older is. But the benefits of age really is um, just the experience in in working with dancers. Um, what what's important now for me is much more focused on on their experience, actually, than my experience. Um, I have made many, many ballets. I've had many successes. I've had many failures. Um, for me now, it's less uh, priority to focus purely on my own success with a premiere. And, and really, because that will happen or it won't, it's very, very hard to, to know. Um, when you're creating a new work, whether you're going to create something that is going to be successful or not. Um, and so much of, uh, of the process, all of the process, um, is, uh, is for me the, the joy, really. It's the being in the room, it's the watching the dancers master the choreography and then move beyond pure, the, purely the technique and, and sort of transcend that with their artistry. Um, the relationship that I develop with the dancer in the room is now, for me, as important, maybe even more important than my relationship with the, with the public. Um, so it's, uh, I think that's the difference, that's the shift for me. And have you found now some ways when you come to the studio, so 
often unknown people as you're staging, restaging your ballads in different countries. Is there some trick? How you open their hearts towards you? How you start to talk to them? Um, always be kind. <laughs> yeah? <laughs> because Be kind because, um, you know, through kindness you can also be very firm and you can be very clear on what you want. But uh, dancers are very, very fragile. You know, they seem so strong. They seem physically, of course, very, very strong. I think to somebody who is not a dancer, they seem like superhuman almost. And, you know, physically they are, but also they're very fragile. Um, uh, they, uh, they invest so much of their, of their being in, in what they do. It's not, just, it's not just a job, it's a way of life. They, they, they're breathing and eating and every, every aspect of their life is focused on on what they present to the public on stage in the end. So a good atmosphere is really important for me in the room. Um, I've, as a dancer, was sometimes pretty brutalized by choreographers and by, by ballet staff. And, and sometimes that achieved very, very strong results on stage. But I remembered uh, hating those experiences mm. with a passion. And, And what dancers do is so hard, so physically demanding and so mentally demanding as well that to be compassionate um, without lowering any standards, you know, I expect the best from them. And if they don't deliver that, then we talk about it. But, um, but that, that for me is really um, is the key, I think. And eventually, um, once you have the trust of the dancers, they, they give so much more. If they want to be there, they'll, they'll give you everything. Because there are certain directors uh, and certain people of the theater who think no matter what, you have to get this emotion from the person and you can do it with different tools. And the only thing which pays back is the result when audience should get this or he should become maybe even a bigger actor. Like you said, for example, your first teacher was very tough with yeah, you also, yeah. especially in ballet education. Yeah. It's a big discussion now. How strict you're supposed to be? Very strict. I, I mean, uh, I do think that in order to achieve excellence, you have to be demanding. You have to demand the very best. Um, but I, I do think there are ways to achieve that without, without brutalizing, without um, demeaning, uh, without lowering the confidence of particularly of a child. Um, I, I think, you know, that it can also swing the other way too much and where everyone is kind and nobody does wrong. And, and in ballet, that's impossible because, you know, a fifth is a fifth. Um, a well-pointed foot is a well-pointed foot. The height of a leg is the height of a leg. There's no doubting that. Um, technically, the technique is what it is. It's just uh, how, you, how you achieve that, how you draw that from, from a dancer so that they can have the strength of the technique but then eventually have an open heart and an open mind to become an artist because um, so many, uh, from my generation, so many of the dancers that I grew up with that went through school and, and then started through the company, um, they left the ballet uh, world uh, broken. Mm. And um, I was very lucky because my teacher was very strict, but I was very high up in the, in the level of the class. Um, he liked me. Um, but, you know, I have classmates who are still seeing their therapists every week to, you know, to, to overcome, you know, the, those, those years as a, as a young ballet student and as a young dancer. So I know, I understand, and I try very hard not to contribute to that as a, as a choreographer. I understand you wanted your excellency as a dancer. You liked Borishnikov, for example, and I also wonder what particular you liked in him. But at a certain moment, you decided to change. Um, was it a slow pass for this decision or it was an abrupt decision that all of a sudden you woke up and you said, no, 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 I should do this? Yeah, I, it wasn't, I wasn't, uh, I, I wouldn't say it was an abrupt uh, decision, but uh, it was more like a realization for me that I had this other gift that I was very fortunate because I was being invited to make ballets all over the world. Um, I was still dancing and <clears throat> for me, the the division of my energy was too hard to manage. Um, uh, and, and I reached a point where I, I kind of realized that maybe I wasn't going to be a star dancer. Mm. And of course, we all aspire to that as children. Nobody aspires to be in the court of ballet. You know, we all want to be the Siegfried or, you know, Albrecht. So 
there came to this point when I was 28 years old, I was a soloist with the New York City Ballet. I, I knew my strengths and my weaknesses as a dancer. I was very realistic about that. And it's funny because f each year that I'd been in the company, I'd been learning the Cavalier role in the Nutcracker. And every year I was called to learn it and every year I wouldn't do it. And after seven years, I was like, you know what? Let's just not learn it this year. <laughs> <laughs> Let's not go through the, the stress of learning it and not performing it. And that was actually kind of the little spark for mm. me. And of course, I was very lucky because I had, I had all of these opportunities lined up. Um, so it was really a very, very easy transition. Again, you know, I was, I was lucky because so many dancers don't have that, uh, that transition, um, uh, um, the ease, that ease of transition. Oh, you said you were inspired by Baryshnikov. Did it change your attitude toward dancers when you became a choreographer? Are the same thing inspiring to you? Are the same artistry qualities still important to you? You know, that's very interesting because I always admired Misha's te technical abilities and his, um, just his uh, almost kind of animalistic bravura on stage and completely the opposite from my dancing. I was much more like Anthony Dowell. I had the very English line. Um, I didn't have a huge jump. I wasn't a bravura dancer at all. And I think that's why I, s I loved Misha so much because he represented everything that I wasn't. Um, and I knew I would never be that dancer, but there was just some, you know, you always, I think, aspire to or desire what you don't have. <laughs> And in that, you know, it was, you know, curly hair or straight hair. In that case, as a young dancer, it was, I wanted to jump like that. I wanted to turn like that. Um, it looked so easy and so magnetic. Um, so, yes, I think now my taste perhaps has changed. I look for, um, and this is not to suggest that Misha was not a, a deep artist at all, because he, he had, he could be very, very poetic, but I look for, um, dancers who can um, bring some of their own personality, some of their own voice to my work. Um, I think, I think uh, great choreography comes from, um, from a, a mixture of the personality of the dancer that it's created on, the, um, their, yes, their physical abilities, but also their inner abilities, their artistic abilities, their soul. And, and then my ability to see that and then to shape it into choreography, to shape it into a role. Um, and sometimes that's conscious, sometimes it's unconscious, sometimes I know I'm doing it, sometimes I feel like the process is not going well and then suddenly something emerges that's very beautiful. Or if it, it's so unpredictable, it's delightfully unpredictable actually, the, the process of, of creation because you just never really know with each project how it's going to unfold. But very often when you, I was listening to some of your interviews and you said, we decided how we cut the story, then we decided this, then we decided who we. Um, the uh, composer, um, designer, you know, I work very closely <laughs> with my collaborators. Um, when we did uh, Winter's Tale, for example, I rented a small house um, near the beach in, uh, in New York. And um, it was a very wet weekend. And um, uh, Joby Talbot, the composer, and his wife Liz, and myself and my husband, we went to this house and we read Winter's Tale together. We had a play reading and it was, we laugh about it now because <laughs> It took us six and a half hours to get through the play because we were trying to, none of us are Shakespearean scholars. It's a very complex play. Um, and to, to understand the imagery, to understand the, you have to really read a line and then refer to okay. a note. And, <laughs> and, um, and we just laughed that if, if that performance of Winter's Tale had been recorded, um, people would just be amazed that actually this ballet could have come from that first meeting. But it did, and um, it was a very, very good lesson for us. And then Joby and I spent time after that, and we f started to create a structure um, for a musical structure. And then from there, you know, he began the composition, and then, and then I began the choreography. Very interesting indeed. And then designer came later then in this. Designer case. comes later. Um, 
Bob uh, Crowley, who we had both, Joby and I had both worked with before on Alice's Adventures in Wonderland. Um, Bob actually was more a part of the, the initial process of Alice. You know, mm. We actually read the books together. And in this case, we worked with a playwright um, who helped us to sort of create a little bit more of a through narrative because, of course, Alice is very episodic and, and so much of the book is about word, word games and hidden mathematical problems and, um, and sort of obscure um, Victorian caricatures of politicians and, and all of these things that are, very, of course, very hidden and embedded and quite hard to, to really communicate through dance. So we had a playwright work with us to sort of help to create a little bit more of a through line of the story. With Winter's Tale, um, an outline of the plot, potential plot, uh, was created for me by a Shakespearean director, um, Sir Nicholas Heitner, who ran the National Theatre in London, who, is now, who now owns a very successful new theatre. Um, and his interpretations of Shakespeare over the past you know, 20 years have been quite uh, groundbreaking, um, can very contemporary in their presentation, yet still very true to um, the, 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 the material, to the plays themselves. So he, he helped us with making a synopsis that he thought might work, and then we built ours kind of alongside of it. We rejected some of his ideas, but we took some of them also. And then, um, and then we went to Bob and we said, okay, this is where, where, what we're thinking now. Where does this world live? What does it look like? How is, how do we, and, and I remember Bob and I spent a long time just looking at a, an empty model and uh, placing items that he designed from other shows just to try at first to kind of come up with a, um, uh, flexible, movable, sort of choreographic flow, um, because all the shows we do together have movement elements within the scenery as well. You know, the, in the case of Winter's Tale, these big, big towers, they sort of almost dance at times. They're, they're very elegant, they're huge, but they, they move um, through the piece. Um, because I prefer a more sort of contemporary style of scene transition. I don't like to bring in a front cloth and mm -hmm. or do a blackout. You know, it's nice to, it's quite cinematic in a way in, in its approach. You're always connected with some f part of the story. You're never leaving the story. Um, and then each moment in your mind, particular dances key, because they're even saying that Shakespeare sometimes was writing down texts already pronounced by some actors. Yes, yeah. So in which moment the shapes of the heroes uh, done according to particular people, or it came later when you just come to the studio, you had all the characters before you had actual dancers? No, I mean, <clears throat> yes, it's sort of a little bit of both. I always had, um, I always had the original cast, Edward Watson, Voleontes, and, and, uh, and um, uh, Lauren Cuthbertson for Hermione. I always had them sort of in mind for this. Lauren I'd worked with in Alice, she was my original Alice, and Edward is um, in many people's eyes, including mine, you know, a great, great actor-dancer, you know, one of the greatest in, I think, in, in British Ballet's history. Um, so they were very firmly sort of implanted in my mind as we started this project. <clears throat> the other cast members kind of came together a little bit later on. You were saying that one of the major theme, and it, it came to my mind actually only yesterday when I was listening to you, is the subject of forgiveness as one of the major things. When did it come to your mind? Because when I read this play, I was absolutely, I don't know how to say it on this word, mesmerized or whatever. I couldn't put it all together. Yeah. It was like <laughs> so much yeah. happening, incredible yeah. things. And when on top of it, she's alive at the end. It's yeah, <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, there are so many, there's a, there's a lot of discussion about the ending of the play, you know, and it, d it very much depends on the interpretation of the director. You know, some directors choose for Hermione not to ever look at Leontes. In fact, she doesn't speak to him. She only speaks to Paulina in mm. this final scene. Um, some choose for them to connect and for her, even though she doesn't speak to him, to look at him, uh, to take a hand, to make some kind of gesture of forgiveness. Some choose not. Some choose just the simple fact that she's alive and that the miracle of her still being alive is enough to suggest, 
you know, the fact that she's presented to Leontes is enough to suggest that she forgives him. I chose for a, a more redemptive ending. I chose to, you know, we, we go through this epic kind of journey of, um, of a sort of downward spiral, a maelstrom of, of, um, of emotion. Um, and I think for me to then send the audience home without some sort of sense of true forgiveness um, would be cruel <laughs> after three hours. I do. And for me also, it's a, you know, it's a, it's a too, too often forgotten um, human uh, trait, one of the better traits of, the, of human nature, you know. We are capable of forgiveness even in the face of extreme darkness. And um, it's hard to really, um, it's, I suppose it's hard to, uh, to, to understand that sometimes in the face of, of such terror, in the face of such evil doings. But um, I think actually, you know, really honestly, we would be a better world if we could find our way to forgive more often. And I think that's what's beautiful about this ballet is it shows, you know, okay, yes, it's a fairy tale and it's, a produ it's just a piece of theater and it's, but it is, it does express that in a very clear way and, and it does move people. People are moved by the, the capability of Hermione to, to forgive Leontes despite all that he's done and to understand that sometimes, you know, um, we, we aren't in control, completely in control of our actions. And that doesn't mean that, you know, we, we should necessarily have to suffer for the, for the entire duration of life. Um, you know, in the case of, uh, of Leontes and this production of Winter's Tale, we are left with the image of the child and which is an innovation from the Shakespeare play. There is no, there is no uh, Mamilius in this, in this final statue. Um, so it never goes away, but just the, just that, just the possibility that you can live with, with, uh, with your actions and still be forgiven, I think is, is uh, a nice way to end. Do you think you could do a ballet on a very contemporary story? Because usually it takes either a fairy tale or some unknown time, right? Or some abstract place where it happens. And sometimes maybe for the audience everywhere in the world is easier to relate to that than to very direct portrait of our days. Mm. Or you think it's possible to do something I, like very contemporary thing with I contemporary th characters? Yeah, I do think it's possible. And I'm really interested in, in doing that actually. Um, I don't know when or what, what that project would be, but I think it is possible. I do, I do think that often ballet is a wonderful kind of portal into fantasy, um, that we have a lot of movies, we have a lot of, um, of theater that depicts, you know, c contemporary life, that there are many, many outlets for that, literature, painting, um, and that's not to say that ballet shouldn't be for that, and I think it is possible, and I would like to know what that story is, and I hope one day I'll be able to present it to you. But I do also think that there is um, something that ballet offers that, that many of the other art forms um, uh, are sort of less inclined to offer these days, and that is pure fantasy and pure escapism and beauty. Was that this which attracted you first to the ballet as a small child? How you created this box which you have at home, this model which is what you play? Was it your way to create your own world apart from the real world? Yes, I think so. I mean, I think m many kids are, you know, building farms and building and playing with fire engines. And, you know, you're, you're, as a child, your, your little brain is creating, you know, and, and um, and building cities and uh, um, and talking to imaginary people in the garden. Well, maybe that was just me, I don't know. But, um, so in a way, what I get to do is, or what I've been able to do through my life to this point is hold on to a part of that. And I think a lot of people lose that, you know. Such a, I'm, at heart, I'm a big, big kid and, um, and and yes, so this is an extension in a way of those, of those imaginary, you know, worlds that I created in my little model theater. 
It was um, that from the wood. What was it? Yeah, oh, it was a little was a wood. Box. No, it was a little wood. There's a, an English company called uh, Pollock's Toy Theatres, and they they're Victorian. Um, little Victorian playhouses that you know are in model form, and and my father made me like a little strip of um, of lights that I connected to a car battery, so I had light for it, and yeah, and um, and we would go and see some theatre in London or some local theatre, and then I would come back and I would be bu busily redesigning the set from what I'd seen, um, and. Uh, so yeah, it's sort of, this is just a grand continuation, a very grand continuation of that. And I was wondering, you explained yesterday that in Alice in Wonderland, in the tea party, there is the reconstruction yes. of this. And you said that Alice was so dear to you as you were listening to this for many years. Well, the ballet you created, the characters we have on stage, how much they reflect your child imagination of this fairy tale characters you had as a child in your mind when you were listening to this tale. Mm. And uh, also how much of your inner self usually you think, I mean, you cannot say exactly, comes to your ballets. Oh, I think a lot of my, I think a lot of my inner self, I think, um, I'm often asked to describe sort of why I choose certain themes or how they find their way into my work, particularly with the abstract work, because I work very spontaneously when I make an abstract ballet. I don't mm. go in with a, a clear vision for a piece um, that that evolves as the process, you know, um, uh, as the process goes on. Um, yet at the end of it, there always seems to be some some story, some um, quite magical connection. Yeah, yeah. Um, which I can only be coming from from me, from within. Um, and then, you know, something like Alice is, is, um, is very much kind of, uh, uh, for me, uh, an expression of my, of my childhood imagination on stage. Um, and my association with these characters from listening over and over to the cassette tape of Alice in Wonderland as a little boy, going to sleep every night, I would put the tape in. And, um, it was the way that, you know, my, my mom knew I would be okay once the lights went out. Um, so I listened to that for many years. And also we have, in our family, we have a very treasured uh, first edition copy mm. of the second book of the Alice Through the Looking Glass, which was on our bookshelf. Um, uh, uh, and, you know, we were, we were allowed to only, like, only look at it with the parents and it could only come off the shelf if mom and dad were there. And so there was this sort of... It felt like a like a big treasure in our house. So I think those those connections with um, with my desire to create a very English ballet for the Royal Ballet based on an English literary theme um, were were sort of really really good ingredients to to make this work. Nowadays, when you have a free time, what do you prefer to do? To go somewhere, visit some cities, go to some place, read some books, listen some music? I just wonder what could be your source of inspiration, basically, outside of the theater? Um, I, love, I love to travel, actually. Traveling is now is a huge passion. Um, so whenever I have the chance to, uh, to go to a country that I haven't visited, and of course, I travel a lot for work as well, which is great, but I only usually live between, in this case, the Metropole Hotel and the Bolshoi Theatre, <laughs> with a few hours here and there to maybe see something. Um, I love to travel, experience different cultures. Um, theatre is a big passion for me, so I read plays, I see a lot of musicals, I see a lot of plays. I try to see almost everything on Broadway when it opens. Um, uh, and uh, also in London, you know, I'm very fortunate because I sort of live between London and New York, so I two big, big theatre capitals. Um, uh, so, and really that's all I have time for because I'm mostly working, actually, to be honest. I'm pretty, I'm pr pretty back to back and that's wonderful. Um, so uh, a period of off time is quite, is quite rare for me. Meeting your husband, who is, I understand, is a yoga teacher. Yeah. Did it change somehow your mind? I, because I don't know. For me, yoga is very much bound also with certain philosophy. Mm. Philosophy where we suppose, first of all, to take the life day by day, the way it is, moment by moment. Mm. But I don't know if you think 
about your life path like this? So if you have like a long drawing line, knowing where it should sort of bring you at the moment? No, actually, really, it's I do live. And actually, I was texting <laughs> with a friend this morning. I was like, don't forget to live in the moment. <laughs> so he's experiencing some <laughs> horrible breakup in New York. And I, I was Aww. like, we just remember, you know, live moment by moment. Um, and I do, I do believe in, in that philosophy. And for me, so much, there is so much that's rich in my life um, compared with just the lives of even, you know, many of my friends and my family that not to experience each moment that to, uh, to like, I feel responsible in a way to make sure that in every moment I'm listening as much as I can. I'm experiencing, you know, this with you. I'm going, you know, in a few moments I go upstairs and also not to, uh, not to try to look forward to success or because that that's a recipe really for anxiety for me anyway, and it was for a long time, thinking about, is this going to work? Is it going to be successful? Um, if it isn't successful, will I ever work again? What will happen? You know, mm. so much. There worries. Was so many worries that um, actually will always be there because that's just who we are. Unfortunately, that's, our, that's, our, um, that's how we're hardwired as, as human beings. But, but yoga and meditation, particularly for me, has been, even just five minutes in, in yeah. the morning, has been incredible. Um, and, uh, and you're talking to like quite a, you're to a very English person who, if you had said 15 years ago, you know, you'll be meditating every morning, I would have laughed at you and said, you know, that, that's rubbish. Just, just be strong, you know, just live your life. And, and um, so it's, yeah, it's interesting how um, how that has shifted a little bit for me. So does it have any particular value to do your production on historic stage of the Bolshoi theater? Or this kind of values sort of change through the age? And you are more interested, well, I don't know, to work with Smirnova, Krisanova, Vinogradova, or other people from the Bolshoi? I'm so interested in working with all of those dancers, all the dancers that I have so far in Winter's Tale and all the casts I'm really, really enjoying. Um, Actually, though, my, run, my one request was for Winter's Tale to be on the historic stage. Mm -hmm. Because um, when I was here creating Misericords, the theater was closed. The, we, so we performed on the new stage, which is also a beautiful stage. But, and it was proposed that Winter's Tale would be on the new stage. And I, and I asked, um, it, would be, it would mean a lot to me to perform in this great theater. And, you know, the Royal Ballet came, I think, maybe five or six years ago, and they brought DGV, and it was performed here on the stage, but I couldn't come. And, and also, I think Winter's Tale is epic. It's an epic piece, and it feels like it should be seen in, a, in an epic setting. And uh, where could be more epic than, you know, the historic stage of the Bolshoi Theatre? I remember the very first time I met you, we were discussing Cinderella chance to do it in the Bolshoi, and then you did it somewhere else. Uh, not in the Bolshoi. In Cinderella, you already had this Prokofiev music. Mm. I don't know what about your ballet happened to be and what were in your mind when you were doing finally Cinderella. Yeah. I remember first discussion. Yeah. You know, the reason I said no to Cinderella the first time was, um, I think it was before Alice, so it would have been my first full-length ballet. And for me to come here to do my first full-length ballet was, too, at that moment in time, was too much, too much pressure. Um, even doing it at the Royal Ballet, where there hadn't been a full-length ballet for, I think, 16 years, there hadn't been a successful full-length ballet for over 20 years. Mm -hmm. um, that was already quite a lot of pressure, but it was in my hometown with dancers that I knew. I just felt also, I have so much respect for the Prokofiev score. I love it so much, but it's very long. And at the time, I remember there was discussion about only doing the full score here. And for me, that was also not something that I felt that I wanted to undertake. Um, because as great as it is, um, it, it just feels after a while, like I um, wasn't sure that I would have the ideas to be able to realize it fully. Um, and then a few years later, I had created Alice. 
Um, I, w I was uh, commissioned to do a Cinderella for um, a co-production between San Francisco Ballet and Dutch National Ballet, both companies I'd worked with before. They were happy for me to make some eliminations to the score. I just felt ready. Um, in hindsight, and I love what I created for them, and I'm just about to do a big production of it in London at the Royal Albert Hall in the round, um, a sort of large-scale version of it um, with the English National Ballet. So I'm very proud of it. Um, but in hindsight, of course, I think, well, it would have been amazing to have made Cinderella for the Bolshoi. <laughs> but in your mind, do you have some other great scores, famous ballet scores like Roma and Juliet, Sleeping Beauty, Nutcracker, Swan Lake? Shall we see your versions of this ballet? Swan Lake, know. Nutcracker, <laughs> and Sleeping Beauty. I've made already. Oh, sorry. Yeah, Swan Lake I, I made. I cut away this question. <laughs> it's okay. No, it's fine. <laughs> Don't worry. Um, Romeo and Juliet is a score that I love, and maybe one day that's a score that I will, I will tackle. Um, so many great versions of Romeo, though. Uh, or so many versions of Romeo, I should say. Not many great versions, but so many versions of Romeo. I feel like I would need to feel like I had a really strong idea to make some, some fresh production of Romeo mm. that didn't feel like... It lived in the same kind of world. Right. Um, lots of great music, though, and uh, and you know, lots of potential new, great new music for ballet as well. Surely. Well, you said yesterday that when you do your restaging of your ballet, you change some minor details, and then your notators have to put it down, etc. I just read a book of a friend of mine. He's a painter, and he said, "Certain morning, you come to the painting, and you see it's finished." Yesterday you didn't notice it, but yeah. today you look at it and it is finished. One, how you to understand about your ballet piece? That's it. That's finished. I don't touch it any longer because, of course, you're alive and you're changing. But you today, not necessarily more clever or more talented than you five years ago, mm. when you stop to change your work. Or you shouldn't stop. I don't know. Well, it's interesting you ask that because a few of the changes that I've made here, I made in the first week. And then last week, I changed them back mm. because... I was like, is this really an improvement on what we had before? No, not really. Maybe it's an, an over-embellishment or is there anything that I'm doing that is really contributing to more um, integrity in the work? So sometimes it's good to recognize that also, that you, know, you can change the work, but it doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to make it better. In fact, you could actually be damaging it. So. Um, but for me, more of the alterations are made specifically for dancers. If they have an idea that works very well, or if they, particularly with a ballet like Winter's Tale, where they have to be, they have to understand at every moment through, particularly the, for Leontes and Hermione, understand at every moment how they're feeling, you know, how uh, Leontes is a great role for a dancer because you experience such a, breadth of human characteristics, human emotions. You know, you go from this, this strong, good, loving man to this broken, dis dis distressed, um, distraught monster. And then slowly you climb your way back up over the course of time. And once again, you become good and solid and through your life experience, you, you learn. And, um, and so if a dancer playing Leontie says to me, well, in this moment, I f I'm feeling this, and you know, maybe I could, I could turn and I could actually look at her in this moment, or I could just place my hand on the shoulder of my friend, or little things like that um, can often be really uh, exciting. And it just, it's just a tiny, tiny detail, but it can change a lot. You know, it can change the intention of a step completely. Um, just eye contact or, um, uh, yeah. So, and that's, that's always fun to, to have that sort of moment of process with, with dancers, even though their role isn't being created on them, then they feel like you're, you know, the, like you're taking up the sleeve so that it fits them a little better or cinching it in the, the waist a little bit so it actually works for them. So listening to you, I don't believe too much in recreation ballet after notation from 19th century. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, I think there are things that probably, things about some of those recreations that belonged in the 19th century <laughs> that maybe don't need to be seen now. Other than, of course, for, you know, for historic purposes and for it's fascinating to see 
perhaps what was going on. Um, but uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, I have mixed feelings about those recreations as, as well. I just hope that as long as we have Wintertail in our repertoire, you will be coming and watching it yourself and talking to dancers and being with us. And I also would love to hope so much that one, maybe several dancers would inspire you to create something together with Bolshoi. I hope so too. Thank you very much, Thank Christopher. You.